later. We are in the middle of a series uh, called Nine Flavors, One Fruit. And we've been talking about uh, the fruit of the Spirit being singular. Here are the things that the Spirit of God should be harvesting or producing in your life. And so we've talked about love and joy and peace and patience. Do you guys know that was like the longest sermon that I preached this year? <laughs> it was when I preached on patience last week. Uh, just it was unintentional. Okay, I promise you. But today we're going to talk about kindness and goodness. And these are, these are two characteristics that are really contagious. When you meet somebody who is kind, it's really hard not to be kind back. Or when you meet just a really good, genuine person, it's hard to feel discouraged or not uplifted when you're around people like that. A couple weeks ago, I was reading a story about a lady who worked for Universal down in Florida. And there was a young boy who was autistic. He was standing in line, and he was um, waiting for the Spider-Man ride. Angel and I, we got to go to Universal a few years ago for Harry Potter World. Whoop, whoop. But now a lot has been added to it. And so we want to go back. I know some of you are like, what, Harry Potter? But uh, anyways, I'm a fan, childhood, whatever. So anyways, we want to go back. But this little guy was, was standing in line. Spider-Man is his favorite character, so he could not wait to get on the ride. Maybe of you, some have read about this story. And so it's his turn. He's getting ready to get on the ride, and it shuts down. I know, right? Kind of a travesty. First world problem. But he, is, he, he has autism, and so he goes into what's called an autistic meltdown. If you have a child or a family member that has severe autism, you guys, you guys know. It's a very challenging um, thing to, to deal with. And so he throws himself down on the ground, and he begins screaming and crying. He's really upset. And as a young man with disabilities, you know, your heart does go out to him. And so the worker comes over. And tries to get him up because if you know anything about a ride shutting down, you got a lot of people who are trying to leave and get out of the way. And here is this poor little boy lying on the floor, screaming and crying. And as a parent, I mean, I have kids, young kids. As a parent, you kind of put yourself in that situation. You break out in a hot sweat. You're really upset. Other people are looking at you and judging you. And so here this worker, once she finds out what the problem is, she lays down on the floor with him. And she tells him, you just let it out. And she calms him and she encourages him. And that meant so much, here's a picture, it meant so much to mom who was standing there in the midst of struggling, you know, with her son. And so uh, she just worked through the situation, got down on his level and was so kind and so good uh, that it made national news. And so they went to customer service afterwards and they showed customer service what this worker had done and they rejoiced together. They even, mom said they were crying and uh, they just couldn't believe that somebody would be so kind and so good to get on their level and see things from, from her perspective. Well, that's what we're supposed to be as Christians. We are to be kind and we are to be good. And the customer service says, look, we do a lot of training um, for situations and scenarios like this, and we prepare the best way that we can. Well, this morning, I want to tell you how to be kind and how to be good. And the way that you do that is you prepare through prayer, and then you put it on. You make the choice to be kind and to be good. Let's talk a little bit about what kindness is. At the root of it, kindness means to take and to use. A lot of us, when we think of a kind person, we think of somebody who has a sweet disposition. But the biblical idea of kindness goes a lot farther than that. It has the basic sense of excellence or serviceable or useful. It's like having the perfect tool for the situation. You've been equipped and you got the perfect tool for the situation. You know, as a, as a guy, I was not raised with a father figure. Um, dad passed away when I was younger. Nobody taught me anything. My grandfather tried, but I was really stubborn. And so it was hard to teach me as a kid. I'm left-handed and he would always make fun of me. You know, you gotta get, you gotta get a left-handed hammer because I could not nail a, a straight nail if my life depended on it. I think one summer I bent three nails every time I tried to nail one nail in when I was building something with my grandfather. Absolute disaster, right? But I collect tools, and sometimes you don't always use your tools all the time. Uh, one of our elders, Toby, he, he and I were talking about this earlier on this week, but you still got to have the tool because there's going to be a situation, if you were to get rid of it, the perfect tool for the situation, you need to have it. So we as men collect tools over time. That's, that's what it means to be kind. It means to have a certain disposition that's useful, that's serviceable. It's like a, a, a worker bee. You know, a worker bee is perfectly designed to serve. 
That's what it means to be kind. When the word is applied to a person, it meant that they were decent, they were honest, they were reliable and helpful. So it's not just a sweet disposition, that person is so kind, but it's saying this, that person is always willing to help. That's what kindness actually means. And here's the cool thing about kindness. Remember our key phrase, if I'm busy doing spiritual things, your turn. That's right. I won't be doing sinful things. We're all going to get on board, I'm telling you, by the end of this sermon series. If I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And so here's the deal. If I am busy pursuing kindness, I'm praying for it, and I'm putting it on, I won't be harsh. You know, people who are kind, they avoid the sharpness and the harshness that we know a lot of people struggle with and have today. When you're busy with spiritual kindness, you won't be busy with fleshly harshness. To be harsh means to be embittered, indignant, irritated. It means to produce a bitter taste in the stomach. A couple years ago, I ate Taco Bell. I had a chicken quesadilla and a taco. It comes with it. I felt like a brick was in my stomach for three days. I'm not joking. It was just this mass that would not move. I felt so sick. You know the last time I had a quesadilla from Taco Bell? Never (laughs) since that happened. I have not. It produced this embittered, terrible taste in my body. And when when I think about eating it, I just can't. And now I need to share with you a very tragic story. A few weeks ago, I had to fix myself some chicken wings. I, you know, they were raw, so I cooked them, I marinated them myself, and I put them in the air fryer, and I ate some. And then next morning, I, well, actually that night I woke up, this is really tragic, I felt so sick. I was sick all day. Finally, my body rejected it. And you know what's so tragic? I can't even think about eating chicken wings anymore. Isn't that sad? I mean, what kind of American am I if I can't eat chicken wings? Who am I? But... But that's what it means to be harsh. You have developed, I know, terrible example, I'm sorry. You have developed this embittered, irritated, rejecting attitude where people don't trust you anymore. You're sharp with your words. You're sharp with your response. And so people won't be vulnerable with you when you're harsh. But a person who's pursuing kindness isn't rough, isn't rugged. You don't discourage people when you're around them. You don't hurt them with your attitude and the things that you have to say. Kindness is the opposite of harshness. And man, when you're around a kind person, don't you just feel at ease with the person? I mean, you really can be you. You don't have to be guarded thinking, what kind of witty, sharp response are they going to come back with? Can I really trust this person? Are they going to treat me with kindness and gentleness? Or are they going to be mean-spirited and try to inflict pain on me? They know when they approach you that you're not going to be harsh when they have something to share. And you know what? This is exactly like God. You know, sometimes we develop this attitude about God that when we take things to him, he is quick to punish us. Well, that's unbiblical. God doesn't punish his children. He may discipline us, but God is not somebody that's sitting back ready to crack the whip whenever you make a mistake. That he is just so irritated and so embittered against you because you sin and you mess up time and time again. And God's like, are we really going to go through this again? You promised you wouldn't do this yesterday and here you are. Just get out of here. You're like a bad quesadilla at Taco Bell. You know what I mean? God doesn't feel like that towards us. We are his children. He is kind towards us. God died for you. And he already knew all all of your garbage, all of your baggage, all of your sin, and yet he still chose to act in kindness towards you. That's why the psalmist said this, give thanks to the Lord for he is kind. Titus 3, 4, when God's kindness appeared to us, he saved us. God was kind to us by sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Romans 2, 4 says that it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. That when we really see and experience the kindness of God, it changes us. You know, that's why Paul, he talks about this in Ephesians 2. We're not going to read it. But he says, when Jesus Christ returns, when he appears, we will finally understand and experience the riches of God's grace and his kindness. We'll really get it, what God has done, what God has done for us. How through Jesus Christ, God displayed the ultimate act of kindness. Now notice, God's kindness isn't just an emotional disposition or some sweet feeling. It is through service. Isn't that what Jesus said? I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And so kindness carries this very strong attitude. And it always asks this question. 
How can I help? How can I help? It's like going to a restaurant and you have a waiter that comes up. Imagine going to a restaurant, a waiter comes up to you and he's there to serve, but he's nasty. He's mean. He doesn't care about serving you, but he's got to do it to get a job. You know, there are actual restaurants <laughs> where they pay people to be mean to their customers. My, my family and I, you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to say the name of the restaurant from the stage, but you probably have been there. When we went to Myrtle Beach, we went to a restaurant like this where they actually pay the waiters and the waitresses to be jerks to you. And so they call you names. They make fun of you. We actually have these really funny hats and they'd write vulgar things on the front. You know, I'm 12 years old and it's a little bit different. It just seemed so weird. But then after you start to accept it, what do you do? You give it right back, right? My sister tried to pull a little fast one on the waiter. He was handing out drinks and she took the cup from him and then she tried to spill it on his hand. You know what he did? (laughs) He shoved it right in her lap. The whole drink, she was soaking wet top to bottom. Doesn't get fired. I mean, that's kind of a cool job. But imagine, like, elders, do you think we might be able to develop something like that around here? You know what I mean? There's like nobody left. You're all gone. Because nobody wants to be treated that way, right? Well, just think about us. If we're willing to help, but we're nasty about it, well, that's not kindness. But on the other hand, if we have a sweet disposition, but we're never willing to serve, well, that's not kindness either. Kindness has a smile on its face, and it says, how can I help you? And so when we work through this idea of kindness, we need to understand that We're striving away from being bitter. We're striving away from being harsh because we're pursuing the spiritual fruit of kindness in our life. And so when it comes to kindness, how do you get it? You pray for it and you put it on. Well, what about goodness? Let's talk a little bit about goodness. Goodness overlaps with this meaning in kindness in a lot of ways. And if I were to put it like this, if kindness is being helpful, goodness is being productive. Kindness asks the question, how can I help? Goodness says this, let's go do the right thing with grace. If kindness is willing to support other people, goodness is focused on performance, doing the good thing. For instance, the Bible says a good tree produces what? Good fruit. If the land is fertile, it will produce crops. If you have a good employer, the employer will be generous with his workers. That's what the Bible teaches. To have goodness, in other words, means to do what is good. Paul talks about goodness in Ephesians chapter 5. And you know what word he contrasts it with? Greediness. Kindness is the opposite of harsh. Goodness is the opposite of greediness. Greediness is a desire for an advantage. It's lusting for more. You want to have more temporal things. Greediness goes beyond the intended boundaries that God has set out for us. It's wanting something, but wanting more of it, wanting an advantage. And so if you could think of it when we talk about a worker with an employer, an employer who is greedy will take advantage of the people that works for him. He won't be generous. He won't ever give. And Jesus, he wanted to really prove this point home to the Jews when he talked about the goodness of God. And so he gave a parable in Matthew chapter 21, or Matthew chapter 20, verses 14 through 15. And he basically says this. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. He tells the Jews about this master who hired servants throughout different parts of the day. The Jews were the first people to be hired. Now, what's really important to the story is this. The Jews didn't have to be hired by God. It wasn't because they had possessed a certain skill that they were worthy. The Jews were hired by God for the specific service of bringing about the Messiah. And so Jesus wants to teach them this illustration about the goodness of God. And he says, consider this, a master hires servants throughout the day. At the beginning of the day, he hires servants to work for the whole day and he gives them a wage. A few hours later, he hires some more servants. And you know what he does? He pays them the exact same wage. A few hours later, he hires more servants. You know what he does? He gives them the exact same wage as they did the person who worked a full day. And then finally, even up to the very last hour of the day, he goes out and he finds some more workers standing in the street and he says, come on, come work for me. And you know what he does? He gives them the exact same wage. Now, what would you do If you worked all day for a wage that you agreed to and somebody comes in and works for an hour and they get the same wage that you got, well, many of us would probably respond the exact same way. Well, hold on a second. I worked all day and you gave me a hundred bucks. They worked for an hour and you gave them a hundred bucks. What's up with that? We should get a little bit more money, right? That's the justification. They were greedy. They were ungrateful. 
They were embittered and they weren't doing the right thing with grace. And so here's what Jesus says. Did you not agree to the wage that was set? Jesus says, take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? You see, a person who is good doesn't turn their nose up at generosity. It doesn't turn their nose up at somebody being generous to other people, giving others gifts. Now, there's a difference between forcing somebody to be generous. I don't like that, right? If I want to be generous, I want it to be because of the conviction of my heart. Don't give me socialism or communism and force me to give somebody something that I'm not willing to give. That's not generosity when you're forced to give it. But we can't err on the side of not being good because we dislike generosity. And so goodness is doing this, the right thing with grace. Kindness, how may I help you? Goodness, let's go out and do the right thing with grace. And so when the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is kindness and goodness, it means that the core understanding of goodness is doing the right thing with grace. And so that's something that we have to go out and do. It's not some internal disposition. When you say, hey, that's a really good person. Well, why are they a good person? Are they doing the right thing with grace? And you know, sometimes we think people are good because they do things that are gracious, but not right. And other times we think people are good because they do the right thing, but they don't have any grace. No, goodness is doing the right thing with grace. And so when it comes to kindness, we should pray for it and put it on. When it comes to goodness, we should pray for it and we should put it on. And so why do we need to know this? Well, here's the deal. If we fail to harvest goodness and kindness in our lives, we will develop a spirit of harshness and bitterness and gracelessness in our actions and attitudes towards other people. And you know what's really bad about that? If we are harsh and graceless to other people, how do you think God is going to treat us? How do you think people are going to treat you? I mean, you show me a couple, for instance, two spouses, right? A man and a woman married. You show me people who have stopped being kind to each other, and I'll show you a marriage that is fit for destruction, When we stop doing the right thing with grace and we stop saying, how may I help you? It creates this vicious cycle. A husband who's not kind and good to his wife, guess what's probably gonna happen? She's not gonna be kind and good to you. Well, how's he gonna respond to that? It's this vicious, nasty cycle that develops over and over again. And so we run the risk. Here's the problem. We run the risk of God treating us without kindness and without goodness. Now, I don't know a single person in this room that doesn't want the kindness and the goodness of God. I do. And if I want that from God, I should be willing to give it to other people. And so we will get harshness in return. You can't be busy with spiritual things if you don't know what we should be doing, what the Spirit should be producing in your life. So here's the deal. If we are ignorant of kindness and goodness, the second problem is this. We won't produce it in our lives. So we need to be educated on what kindness is and what goodness is. Not only because we want God to treat us that way, but because we want the spirit to produce that in our own life. Here's the number three. This is why it's so important. If you struggle with being harsh with people, you need to get busy pursuing spiritual things. If I'm not pursuing spiritual things, I will be pursuing sinful things. And so in this battle of a graceless culture, in this battle against our own lusts of the flesh, of what we want and what we desire, the greed and the harshness that the flesh produces, we need to be busy pursuing spiritual things so that we won't be pursuing sinful things. Here's another thing. If we pursue kindness and goodness, people will trust us and want a relationship with us. If you want to destroy your relationships and you don't want anyone to be around you or like you, and you want to spend the rest of your life alone, be harsh and be greedy. But if you want to restore relationships, if you want to be happy, (laughs) in other words, seems kind of obvious, but if you want to be happy, be kind, be good, serve other people. You know, when you're discouraged, you know what the Siamese twins of discouragement is? Isolation. And you feel let down, and you feel discouraged, and you just want to be alone. And that makes you even feel worse. But when you're out serving people and loving people and doing the right thing with grace, God gives you relational satisfaction that you couldn't get anywhere else. 
And so those are some really good reasons why we should be kind and why we should be good. And the risk that we run if we don't let the Holy Spirit produce goodness and kindness in our attitude and in our lives. And so how do we do this? Well, I've said it a few times. Number one, pray for it. Ask God, God, fill me with kindness Fill me with goodness. Fill me with love, joy, peace, and patience. Help me, God. Give me this spirit. Let the spirit work through me. If you remember the illustration that I gave at the beginning of this sermon, this woman prepared for this moment. And if we don't pray for God to fill us with kindness and goodness, when the moment comes, if we're not busy pursuing spiritual things, our natural state will be sinful things. Paul had this to say. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, he prayed for the church that God would fulfill every desire for goodness and for the work of faith with power. God, give me the desire to do good things. Help me want to go out and do the right thing and give people grace. God, help me have the attitude of, how can I help you? What can I do to serve you with a smile on my face? God, let the Spirit produce in me that which brings me closer to you and to the people around us. Prayer is preparation for the moments that we will encounter. And here's what I also encourage you to do in your prayer time, meditate about it. You know, when, we, when I played high school football, they not only wanted us to think about how to be a better athlete, but they wanted us to picture in our minds those plays and those situations and those circumstances and train ourselves mentally what we would do and how to react to situ- situations. That's what meditation is, right? When you read the word, you're putting the food in your mouth. When you pray, you're putting the food in your mouth, but when you meditate, you chew on it and you taste it and you think about it. Think about the moments when you can be kind and good. Prepare for those situations that are gonna happen And start right in your own household. Man, when I wake up tomorrow, my kids are screaming and yelling at me because they want waffles. Happened this morning. How am I going to treat my kids? Man, when I wake up in the morning and my wife feels sick and she feels run down, how am I going to treat her when I don't feel great either? I mean, think about the moments when you're at your job or you're with your family or you know you're going to have a confrontation with somebody at work because things have been building and escalating. What are you going to do to be kind and good to that person? Mentally picture those images in your mind. And then be ready and prepared for it. And so, how can I help? Let's go and do the right thing. Pray for God to fill you. Meditate on how you can do that. And then number two, put it on. It's like a jacket. Every morning when it's cold outside, you get up and you make the choice to put the jacket on. And that's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, So, as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion and kindness, and humility, and gentleness, and patience. You know, I had this real big misconception earlier on in my Christianity that God would just zap me and everything would change. I didn't realize that while God could picture me as perfect before his eyes and that I was not guilty and declared not responsible for my sin, and he could love me through that, God says, look, I'm not only going to declare you guiltless and not guilty and you are free, but I'm going to want you to put in the hard work of becoming more holy. And so earlier on in my Christianity, I thought, well, I'll just get jolted and it'll just change. Sanctification doesn't work like that. Being a Christian is hard work. You've got to make the choice. I have to make the choice. And so Paul commanded the church, put it on. Pray for it and put it on. I love Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says this, Therefore, as we have every opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially the household of faith. If we want to be kind and we want to be good, it starts with us praying and putting it on, making the choice to go out and do. So what can you do? You can sign up to serve. You can do good this week. We're going to have a work day here in a few weeks to prepare for our vacation Bible school. It's an entire church family program that we put on at Severn Christian Church. And we're going to prepare the property. And there's a sign-up board. And you know what? Our other minister, Clyde, put donuts on the sign-up board. So when you sign up, you can actually take a donut with you. You want to talk about the goodness of God, it's right there. And I didn't even have to come with that up by myself, right? Donuts are right there in your presence. The goodness of God is waiting for you. You can sign up to serve. You know, you could cut grass, you can weed eat, you can ask, what can I do to help? Those are some simple ways. You can volunteer for a ministry, our children's ministry, our kids' ministry, our student ministry, our group's ministry. 
I mean, there are so many ministries that you have the opportunity to serve and go out and do the right thing with grace. You can volunteer for a service. You know, every Sunday we take the Lord's Supper. We commune together. It's commanded in the Bible. That's what the apostles did. That's what we want to do. And you know, that stuff doesn't just happen with a snap of your fingers. It takes people to prepare it. They clean it up. They put it together and they serve. That's something that you can do. How can I help? Let me go do the right thing with grace. You could serve in an event. You could join our welcome team and smile and love people when they come in. You know, that's the consistent thing that I hear back every single time for new people that come to our church. They are blown away at how nice and kind and good our welcome team is. And our welcome team is awesome, if you haven't noticed. They're great. They do so many wonderful things and they are kind and hospitable and they are always smiling and happy to show people around the church. I mean, that is front lines ministry, game changing ministry to help our family grow. You could serve there. You could sign up for an event. We have Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School takes a lot of work, takes a lot of involvement. That's something that you could do to serve. How can I help? Let me go do the right thing with grace. We put on Fall Fest. We host a community event to love people and give families a chance to connect with one another. You could sign up to serve, host a game for one hour, set up, clean up, serve food, be a part of the registration. There are so many ways that you could sign up to serve and be involved to love other people. You know, my favorite moment from last year at Fall Fest, I was sitting down at the basketball um, shoot and a mom and her son, they just them together, came up and they played three rounds of basketball and they laughed and they competed against each other and just seeing them be able to bond and love one another, it was one of the greatest parts of my day. That's why we're here. You could sign up for one of our community partners, Arundel House of Hope the pregnancy clinic, the Samaritan women, hope for all. You could donate goods. You could actually go to these organizations and volunteer. You can go to these people and say, how can I help? Let's go do the right thing with grace. There are so many ways to let the fruit of the spirit work in your life, but it's not gonna be done unless you choose to do it. And so a lack of service and productivity in our faith ultimately means this, we've got a fruit problem. We've got a spirit problem, but if you're willing to pray and you're willing to put it on, the harvest, the fruit, the outcome of God's spirit being in your life will be made known. And if you notice this very important trick, you know how you develop a habit? Do it every day. 21 days turns into 90 days. 90 days turns into 180 days. 180 days turns into 365 days. And the next thing you know, when you are disciplined by making a choice every day to follow after something, it becomes more natural. And so my encouragement to you is this. If you are busy being in the spirit, the spirit will be busy being in you. Pursue these things. And what will happen? Well, you'll find yourself confronting your sin and overcoming it. And that's awesome. If you've got something that you're wrestling with, a sex addiction, an anger issue, a greed issue, if you have sin that you are wrestling against, get busy pursuing spiritual things. And I can promise you on the authority of God's word, you will overcome your sinful things. If you're busy being kind, you won't be harsh. If you're busy being good, you won't be greedy. I'm going to end with a story about a man named Barnabas. If you've uh, read the book of Acts, you know a little bit about this man. Uh, Barnabas meant an encourager. He was an encourager to the church. He was generous, not just with his words. He was kind with his words. He was good with his words, but also his money, his actions. I mean, the guy was just a solid man. Well, he was paired up with a guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul, the giant in the Christian faith. And the Apostle Paul was let down by a guy named John Mark, really hurt Paul, fell through, and he made a mistake. We all make mistakes, don't we? Well, Barnabas dealt with it a little bit different than Paul. You know what Paul did? John Mark, get out of here. I don't want you around anymore. You messed up. You're not helpful to my ministry. You've hurt me more than helped me. I want nothing to do with you. And you know what Barnabas did? He stood up to Paul. He disagreed with him right to his face. And you know what he did with John Mark? He encouraged him. He treated him with kindness and he treated him with goodness. And guess what happened to John Mark? Gives me chills just thinking about it. Because of the encouragement, the kindness and goodness of Barnabas, John Mark went on to write the gospel of Mark. Now think about that for a moment. 
Think about how God worked through Barnabas because he was kind and because he was good. And John Mark went on to write the gospel of Mark. Isn't that awesome? And just how kindness through our own life and through our own attitude and our own spirit can make an eternal impact for the kingdom of God. That's what kindness and goodness can do if you'll let it move through you and if you'll choose it. Well, I'd like to think that we never make mistakes and we never treat anybody, you know, with harshness or we're never greedy, but that's not true. But there's good news. If you have made a mistake and you've been unkind and you haven't treated people with goodness and you haven't went out and done the, the right thing with grace, you can change. And you know, the Apostle Paul, he wrote 2 Timothy, one of the last letters he wrote before he died. Here's what he had to say. I want to read it to you. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, He's writing to Timothy and he says this, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is useful to me in the ministry. That's awesome. He came full circle. Barnabas treated Mark with kindness and goodness, developed him in the Christian faith. And Mark came, or the apostle Paul came full circle and said, before I die, let me see Mark. He's useful to me. He's helpful to me and it's enough to make me cry because it's the kindness and the goodness of God come in full circle. You never know whose life you're going to change when you're kind and you're good. How can I help? Let me go out and do the right thing with grace. Mark had a comeback because of Barnabas. The people in your lives can have a comeback if you're willing to help them and love them.